Hello and welcome to an exclusive broadcast. I'm afraid we've started quite late, so if you are if you were expecting us to start at three o'clock, I'm afraid uh, we've lost 25 minutes. But we'll add that on to the end. Um, I hold my hand up. It's my fault. We had a few technical issues my end. I thought I was it was all working, but uh, uh, struggled to get on. Uh, I couldn't get my camera, which was sort of quite key, and I couldn't get the microphone. But we are up live and running. And, um, um, and we are ready to do this broadcast. So it's an exclusive broadcast. It's on uh, YouTube and it's on Facebook. Hello to you all. It's really good to have you on board. We're, it's hosted by Made of Millions. Um, and it's in partnership, I suppose you would say, with Orchard OCD, which is an OCD charity. I'll be telling you a bit more about them uh, a little bit later on. Uh, we're going to be talking about, well, the title is The Truth About OCD, uh, The Truth About Obsessive Compulsive Disorder. And I guess you could say, uh, it does what it says on the tin. We're going to have a conversation about the challenges of OCD. We're also going to be talking, and this will give it a positive feel, we'll be talking about um, a campaign to raise money uh, to trial a new, uh, potentially exciting new uh, treatment for OCD. So that, that will be coming up. So uh, the truth about OCD is what we're talking about. It's a conversation. Just for, you, for those viewers here in the UK, I'm sure Fletcher, you probably would have seen me possibly on television, on the BBC, uh, on things like Country File, uh, on ITV, or things like uh, Good Morning Britain. If you're watching from the USA, because I know uh, we are being hosted by Made of Millions, so we may have some viewers from the USA, uh, you won't have seen me. Uh, my connection with you is that I was actually born in New York, uh, so I have dual nationality, but I came here uh, when uh, Britain, I'm in London now, uh, when I was two, so I clearly don't have any of the American accent. My connection to OCD is my son was diagnosed with OCD when he was 13. Uh, he started to spiral when he was 12. He's 17 now. He's a lot better. But during that time, he spent six months in hospital and um, missed a year of school. And I would say dragged our family into a very, very difficult place. Um, I think that's one thing that's not talked about uh, when the, the carers, the parents, the people around, the people who are, who are struggling with a mental illness. Now, I said it was going to be a conversation, so I suppose the, the, the key thing is that we have other people talking in this. I'm not going to rabbit on. I need you, if you're watching, to send us messages, questions. We will respond to those. I also need a person to talk to, don't I? Uh, so we're going to be speaking to David Adam. He's, uh, um, well, he's a journalist. He's also uh, a best-selling author of The Truth. Uh, so not The Truth. The Truth About OCD is, uh, is the subtitle of it, and it's the title of this broadcast. Uh, he is uh, well, he's a best-selling author. He's written lots of books, but The Man Who Couldn't Stop was his key book about OCD. Uh, so let's see if we can connect him now. Now, as I say, I've had quite a few technical difficulties, but I have David now. David, can you hear me? I can. Hello. How are you? Excellent. So I'm sorry. I, I think you've actually been waiting there for 25 minutes. Uh, I had a few technical issues, um, and I'm very pleased to see you because I, I couldn't even see myself for a bit. But we're here now. Uh, and I suppose that my first question is, how are you? And I mean that in a very British way, how are you when people just say, yeah, I'm fine, even when they're not fine. Um, I'm, I mean that in a, in a nice way, great to see you. But I also mean in this period, while uh, where the world is on lockdown and even countries that are coming out of lockdown have changed completely, the new normal is very different to how it was a few months ago. How are you coping in this sort of COVID-19 uh, period? Yeah, I'm, I'm all right, thanks. I, I think a lot of people have had it a lot worse than, than me and our, our family. Um, you know, we, we've got a couple of kids in primary school, elementary school who are now being homeschooled expertly by my wife. Um, I'm, I'm, I work freelance, so I, I work from home, you know, before it was fashionable. So uh, it's, it's largely the same for me. Um, in terms of the OCD, uh, I mean, we can get onto this, but my OCD isn't really the kind of OCD that, that is affected by current events. Um, so it's pretty much business, business as usual. So can you tell us a bit about your OCD? I touched on it before you came on. I don't know if you could hear me speaking, but I, I touched on my, my experience with OCD and my son, and I will talk a bit more about that. But tell us how you first came to know about OCD and know that it was affecting you. So I, I've had OCD probably for 28 years or something like that, maybe 29 years. Um, I, I am a lot better now because I, I managed to get very good help and treatment um, and one of the things that I've since done is, is talk a lot about my experiences um, because I find that when I was going through a really rough period I think it helped me to know there were other people out there um, and I think also 
what I was able to do in the book was to just explore some of the questions that I had, and I think other people have those as well. So, so my OCD is is around HIV and AIDS, um, which anyone who grew up in the 1980s will 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 know was a huge, um, uh, just global societal fear, and and one of quite similar to what we're going through now in that a lot of uncertainty, a lot of media attention, a lot of um, fear and anxiety, and um, very much sort of the only, um, at the time, the, un the only weapon that governments had to try and, in their eyes, to save people was to force them to change their behaviours. Uh, and the only ways they had to do that was to scare people, really, so, so they did. Um, and I, I developed, like a lot of people with ACD, developed um, intrusive thoughts about HIV and AIDS and how I might have caught it. You know, ridiculous ones, the kind of ones that the campaigns were there to tell us that we couldn't catch it in those days. Um, and, and I knew that. I, I knew that I couldn't, and yet I still couldn't shake the, these, these ideas, these thoughts that, that maybe, maybe just me, uh, something had happened. And, and with that came a great deal of anxiety um, and fear and, and feeling pretty, pretty crummy, really. Um, and that kind of divided into two things. First, there was the, the, the primary anxiety of being worried about a disease that, that might kill you in, in those days. Um, and secondly, I knew it, I knew what I was thinking was irrational. And so there is that secondary sense of what is wrong with me? Why am I thinking these, these crazy thoughts? Um, I mean, if, no, carry on, carry on. Well, I mean, so, so that, that's the summary of, of me and my OCD, really. And then I, I lived with it for a long time and, and eventually, eventually, eventually uh, managed to get some good treatment. Yeah, and we will be talking a, a bit about treatment and potential new treatments uh, later on because um, we're both part of a charity, Orchard, uh, who are uh, crowdfunding to, to try and trial a new potential. I think it's really exciting. Uh, new drug but we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment it, it's interesting you know, what you say I just I think we've got to assume that most of our audience have uh, an understanding of what obsessive compulsive disorder is but ju just in case you're you're coming to this uh, and you're not sure um, I mean, there are lots of stereotypes aren't there so when people I mean I've seen loads of programs in the UK and I'm sure there are many in the USA as well and around the world where it's it's just a focus on people keeping things in order or people washing their hands excessively and actually, some people talk about OCD and say, oh, actually, I'm a bit OCD and that's quite cool because I'm really organized. Th those are myths. Those are things that actually set us back, don't they, in our, our attempts to, to try and tackle OCD. I, yeah, I, I think, I think the, that kind of classic stereotype is quite damaging, partly because people with OCD get their information from the same place as everyone else. And so if there is a misleading stereotype of OCD out there circulating, um, that will find its way into people who have OCD and that will then confuse them or, or can just completely um, put them on, on completely the wrong track about what OCD is and isn't. I, I think the issue with those stereotypes often is that they focus on the behaviour because it's visible. It's easy to see. We think we can understand it because... You know, we've all turned the light switch on and off. We've all washed our hands. So the fact that someone does it excessively, we think that's just a, an excessive version of, of what we do. So it's in a way, it's almost easier to relate to than, than some other mental issues. But actually, most people with OCD, and I've met a few now, um, they would say that actually, what 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 is the, defi the defining characteristic of the disorder is, is the thoughts, is the the O, the obsessive thoughts, um, which aren't visible which most of us don't talk about because they're pretty horrific um, and in many cases the the behavior the compulsive behavior um, is is done as a response to those thoughts um, so although someone might wash their hands uh, excessively with OCD you know it's a stereotype but it is it is a large feature of many people's OCD it's not usually because they think their hands are dirty in, in the way that people would think about washing their hands conventionally it's more that they it's almost like a safety behavior it's a behavior which gives them some comfort uh, and and it might be in response to a thought which is completely different to what anyone would think about being able to or the need to wash their hands so for example someone might have 
horrible intrusive thoughts about a member of the family dying, for example. And they find the only way they can ease the anxiety that those thoughts cause is by washing their hands, as, as weird and bizarre as that sounds. Um, and that is one of the defining features of OCD, is the weird and irrational nature of it. Yeah, and I mean, so I, I was explaining before I added you to the broadcast, I, I don't have OCD. My son has OCD, and that's how I learned an awful lot about it when he became quite ill. And that actually, just to, to connect them to what you were saying, where um, it was HIV that was when the, the first time when you thought, oh, hang on, something's going on here, I, I've got something that is really affecting me. It feels like OCD is, is well, it's often talked about as the, the condition of our time. So you hear of stories of Spanish influenza and cases of OCD peaking in, you know, in the early last century because of that. When asbestos was found through buildings uh, in, throughout Britain, people, you know, OCD spiked then. Uh, Jimmy Savile, and for those viewers who are in um, the United States, you won't know who Jimmy Savile was, but he was a, a massive television star here in Britain. Um, I mean, you know, he was sort of David Letterman. He was, a, everybody knew who he was and he was there. I mean, I'm 46, he was around when I was young and he died 10 or 15 years ago. And when he died, he sort of died a hero. And very soon after there were many um, allegations of sexual abuse that came forward and that were basically founded. And he became, he's now known as one of the most prolific sexual offenders of young people uh, that had ever been in Britain. And yet he was this hero. And actually what he did was affect lots of young people who had OCD. And that, while my son's OCD is, as you say, the O, oh, that sort of the, the, the battlefield that's going on in his mind, Jimmy Savile has a lot to answer for, for his OCD and for other people. So many, many people, many young people at the time, in the same way that you were affected by um, HIV, will be walking around and they will see a child and they may say, um, oh, I had a bad thought. I had a sexual thought about that child. I'm a paedophile. And suddenly, as we know with OCD, it's like a washing machine in your mind. And the thought, before you know it, you are, you know, you've done something wrong and some the police are going to knock on your door and arrest you. And, that, and that's that's one of the things that I really noticed with my son's OCD. Not not necessarily Jimmy Savile, but I, I feel I look at someone like Jimmy Savile and he did a lot of very bad things. And he's got a lot to answer for in mental health as well, I think. And that, and I, it, it, you know, that it, I see I meet a lot of people, a lot of children who I'm sure your age were HIV, uh, the, you know, younger children, it's, it's Jimmy Savile, and other areas, it's other things. It's, it feels like OCD is the, is, is the mental illness, the mental condition of the time, isn't it? It seems to latch on to and shapeshift into what the, the big fear is in society, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of evidence for that, that, that it's, it's not unique to a particular culture or a particular time. It seems to be with us as long as we've been keeping records of what people think about and, and how know how those kind of anxieties show themselves so you know in in the very olden days it would have been largely based around religion there's a there's actually a form of OCD called scrupulosity where um people who who feel themselves as very devout and, and, and very uh, pure have these terrible thoughts many of which are sort of um almost conflicting with their sense of themselves as being very devout and religious so an urge to worship the devil for example um, and, you know, that's clearly because those people, to them, that's the most sacred, most important thing in their life, um, is, is to be pure and to, th to be thought of as, as being a very devout person. Um, and, and so, and, and as you say, um, pretty much every public health crisis that we've had in certainly the 20th, 21st centuries ha have come with an associated um tale of people who, who develop intrusive thoughts around that um, and I think that it's um, one of the interesting questions is is some people have an OCD which can almost update itself you know so, so with mine it's very much fixed on on HIV and and the HIV of the 1980s um, yeah. and it doesn't really just drift away from that whereas there are some people who who, for example, at the moment, they will be sort of updating their OCD to be anxious about COVID. And maybe they so, will... so, I'm just looking at some of the messages coming in. Kim French on Facebook has said, um, uh, absolutely right on the Savile front, totally not me for six with my OCD. 
Uh, and what we're finding, so just to, to fill you in and fill the people um, watching in, uh, so my son, um, he was 13, he became, I mean, he, he, I think when with mental illness, people sort of, they don't necessarily, if they haven't experienced it, they don't think of it in as debilitating as some physical illnesses. And mental illness is just as debilitating. Uh, so we, we found my son, he couldn't get out of bed, he couldn't feed himself, he couldn't do very basic things, brush his teeth. Um, because the OCD was selling him, if he did that, he, he was a bad person. And w at the time, we were just being locked out, but we've learned since that that was what was going on in his mind. Um, and so my son's OCD, he's in a much better place now. He was in hospital for six months. Uh, he missed school. He wasn't able to go to school for a year, but he managed to um, go to uh, the Maudsley Hospital in South London and got really good treatment there, basically CBT, and he's on medication. And he's in a much better place, but it's unlike your OCD because we have to be really vigilant because it seems to shape shift into something new all the time. You know, it's 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 almost when he's tired, when our exams are on, when he's stressed, we can see that it it, it may be creeping back in a different form, and that uh, it doesn't. It's just different. It doesn't make it any easier or any or, or, or harder. But it it's I I just sort of see OCD as a very clever separate thing outside him that's just always on his shoulder waiting for a moment to, to leap in and jump in and and we have to be really vigilant about it T tell us about what you did then because as a journalist I, i've read that you you basically decided once you started to get better you decided to do what journalists do and write about it that was that was the sort of your outlet wasn't it yeah i mean it took a long time to get there but um uh, i mean fast forward to 20 years from when i first started having these thoughts i finally uh, went and got proper help um and it sounds like it's similar to your son which is the mainline main frontline mainstream treatment which is a high dose antidepressants and cbt um which makes you you know reappraise um your own thought processes and gives you some behavioral tools to, to deal with these thoughts as they come um and yeah i think that as i as i started to feel better i think i just had questions that i want i felt more like a journalist than a patient perhaps and I wanted to know more about what happened to me. And there wasn't really a book as a journalist, I you know, naturally reached for, for books. Um, there wasn't really a book that, that did that. Uh, I found a lot of the books were either written by clinicians and they were very sort of at a distance, uh, or they were written by people who were really in the teeth of, of having an OCD problem. And, and there was sort of a lack of distance for us. And I found both of those quite difficult to relate to. So I'd always wanted to write a book, you know, I, I had visions of writing the great novel, of course, but uh, I thought, well, maybe, maybe this is my, maybe this is my book. This is what I can write about because I can, I write about science and medicine. I thought I could, you know, interrogate it and bring in some of the, the theories and the ideas and some of the deep sort of science almost, but also fill in some of the gaps with my own experiences. And, and so it became this, um, it's a horrible cliche to say I went on a journey of discovery, but I went on a journey of discovery. <laughs> <laughs> You're allowed to say it. We'll, we'll let you off <laughs> once. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so the book helped you discover things, but you also you were helping to explain, you know, your experience and, and, and what you've learned about OCD. I mean, so the same with me. I, I'm a journalist and I work in television, so I'm not an author. And so I, I was shocked by the... Um, and this this isn't so relevant to the U.S. viewers, although it, it, it may well be. But in, in the U.K., we 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 have a serious lack of spending on on mental health, uh, and on in particular in children. So I my shock was that when we discovered that my son was incredibly ill and was diagnosed, and we knew it was OCD, we had to wait nine months for the for to see anyone who knew anything about OCD. And I I mean that for me, I just was shocked. I don't know, it'd be really interesting if you're from the US. I know we've got a few people watching from Australia as well. Denise, I noticed, uh, and Joanne from Australia. Let us know if, if that's the experience there. Mental health always seems to be the poor relation compared to physical health. If you broke your leg and you had to wait nine months, David, I mean, that would be crazy, wouldn't it? Nine months to get your leg fit. But that's how long we had to wait. So I made an investigative journalism program over here. Be, uh, UK viewers will know what it is, Panorama on the BBC, uh, looking into the lack of care for young people with mental health, because what I felt was that um, there's a serious lack of spending for young people. So it's, it's, it's a, I think Young Minds, the charity over here, uh, worked out that it was, it's under 9% of the mental health budget goes on young people. And so, uh, so there's under 18s. And I, we know that 
uh, half of all long-term adult mental health issues start by the age of 14, right across the board, wherever you are. So if you can solve the youth mental health crisis, I mean, I'm talking about seriously mentally ill people, you will give those people, many of those adults, the tools to be able to deal with it in later life. And if you come to it later, you, you're, you're almost like relearning how to drive. But if you can do it when you're learning about life, if you can get those tools, um, that can put you in a great place. So I went to see a government minister about it. And, and she basically told me, oh, no, that's rubbish. The, the, old, the adults are iller, so they need more money. And I, you know, I, was, I was really shocked. And it's something I feel really passionate about, youth mental health. Um, and the other thing that it's made me think is of seeing my son and seeing the treatment. You've mentioned CBT, you mentioned medication and how that's sort of helped him in many ways. But what, what I've been told is, I mean, I know that he's on a high level. The, the go-to for anybody who doesn't know this, the go-to for, for OCD is that you have CBT and very high levels of antidepressants. And I've been told that that may affect my son's brain growth. And I, so I'm sitting here thinking, that's, that's really barbaric. That seems like a very blunt tool to solve OCD. And then I looked into it a bit more and you work out the pharmaceutical companies are just not doing the research because it's not really sexy and it doesn't really earn them any money. I think there's one company, Biohaven in the USA. They're the only big company that are actually doing some research on an OCD treatment. You know, other companies are doing stuff on depression and schizophrenia, but finding a new cure doesn't seem to be anywhere near because no one's doing it. I, I, so with you, was it CBT? Was it high, low, high doses of um, antidepressants, David? Yeah, I mean, it was eventually. It's worth saying that um, if you think the situation is bad now, you know, when I first went to see a psychiatrist in uh, 1995, they gave me an elastic Don't band. Don't look old enough. They gave you an elastic band? <laughs> an elastic oh, so band. that's to put on your wrist that to, was my to every time you have a thought. Yeah. And that, I mean, that's outrageous. I mean, that makes me out angry i don't have OCD, and that makes me angry so so basically what did some what did they tell you what was the instruction with the elastic band so it was it was a um a technique called thought stopping and it sort of has its roots in um behavioral psychology where you know behavior is learned and and so you can the best way to to avoid damaging behaviors is to unlearn them or to learn that there's sort of a cost to them and and so yeah it was just an elastic band you know it's it was on the NHS. It was just a standard brown elastic band. And every time I had one of these thoughts, I was supposed to snap it against my wrist with the idea that, well, I'm not really sure what the idea was. Um, but yeah, but we typically. Did, did it work? Like, what happened? What happened? Well, did you, you imagine how many with thoughts it? like that someone with OCD had? My elastic band lasted about <laughs> 10 minutes, you know, it snapped. And then I had to get another one. And I actually went out and I. Anyone from a certain, a certain age in the UK will remember a stationery shop called Partners, which sort of had budget, yeah. large volume stationery. I went and bought the biggest bag of elastic bands you've ever seen. <laughs> and um, yeah, I mean, so I do a lot of talks and there's often clinical psychologists in the audience. And when I say this, they all put their head in their hands and go, oh God, yeah. I'm so sorry. Um, so, so yeah, now now the treatment is, is a lot more evidence-based, let's put it that way. Um, but it's 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 difficult to get the best treatment to all who need it, either because um, there's, there's a queue with a waiting list and not enough people who can deliver that best treatment, um, or because it sometimes it just takes time for kind of the best ideas and the best techniques to filter through the medical community. So there are people I'm, I get emailed every week from people, uh, I'm, I'm, and often one of the things they say. Is they've been referred to a you know a counselor or a, a, a psychotherapist or something like that which it, it, unfortunately it could mean one of many things in the uk um and and it sort of covers a whole spectrum of different techniques and ideas and thinking and theories and and actually cbt the cognitive behavioral therapy that you need for ocd is quite specialized even within the field of cognitive behavioral therapy so there are people who go to CBT therapists and get what they think of as CBT, but it's not the right CBT for OCD. Um, and, and so th there is a pretty good treatment out there that helps most people most of the time. Um, but not everybody who, who goes for help receives that. It's interesting because I, I recently started getting adverts on Facebook actually uh, to, for treatments, uh, for lessons in CBT. And I, I mean, I don't know how I, the algorithm obviously works out that I have some sort of interest in it. And 
it, it, it seems that I could do some sort of lesson in CBT online. And, and that, you know, initially I'm thinking, wow, that'd be great, then I could help my son. And then, but actually, there's CBT and there's CBT when it comes to OCD in particular. And you need someone who, who specializes uh, in, in the OCD CBT. Now, I, I just want to go through some of these, um, some of the messages coming in. Um, so we've got, uh, I've got one up, really interesting to hear your stories. Um, we've also got, um, this is uh, Karik, uh, how did OCD affect your self-esteem and how did you manage to work on it? Uh, is that something you'd be prepared to answer, David? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it, it shakes your self-esteem. It shakes your view of yourself. In fact, by definition, so these kind of thoughts that we're, we're talking about, psychologists call them um, ego dystonic meaning that they clash with the kind of person we think we are. So if you're religious, for example, you think you're extremely devout and uh, you're getting these thoughts that challenge that, telling you that you're a Satanist, you know, the most extreme version. And, and what that does is that you kind of have, um, I mentioned before the sort of the secondary anxiety of knowing that there's something weird about you. But I think also, in my case, certainly, um, because I didn't tell anybody about it, and that's pretty common. You know, when I actually got the deal to write the book, you know, they were all the publishers were very excited and wanted to press release it, and I said, "No, you can't. You can't tell anybody." <laughs> <laughs> what, 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 you told your, your close family knew, but not your friends, or no? My family didn't know. No. 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 Really? No. So when did they find out? When when they read the when book? Them, yeah, when I told. Them. Um, cause it's, it's interesting you say that. Yeah, yeah what, what, what did they say? Well, I said, you know, you're going to write a book about this. People are going to find out about it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, so so I hadn't I hadn't told anybody really, and so that meant that as well as all the sort of direct anxiety, there was this. Um, I had a sensation that I was sort of fraudulent in a way that I, I, all the relationships I had with people were based on a me that wasn't actually true. Uh, that they didn't really, um, you know, I, I was always living this sort of life in my head that if I wasn't thinking about these thoughts, mm. I'd be doing this now, I'd be doing that now. And I think I sort of um, questioned a lot of my decision making and behaviors. And, and you know, who knows? Because there's no sort of, there's no control experiment to someone's life. You know, you just, there's no way of knowing how I would have been different if I hadn't had this terrible condition. But, but I think in the early years, especially, I found myself thinking that this isn't really me you know this isn't this isn't how I would act to behave these aren't the things that I would say if I didn't have this parallel narrative in my head and I wasn't sort of distracted by something else and and that makes you um question not just your self-esteem but almost your just sort of self of self-worth or self um determination almost it's a bit like a bit like sort of you run also pilot um, it, it's interesting you say that you haven't told anyone because as a parent of a child with OCD, we felt there was a real stigma. And I think this is right across the board when it comes to mental illness. Your child is ill and, you know, it is at, acting quite strangely compared to other children. And all you want to do is protect them. So my son, um, as I said, the, you know, the OCD was debilitating. But when he went out, what, what he said, he was having quite strong sexual and violent thoughts. And to, to prove to himself that he didn't like the thoughts, he would do something quite embarrassing. So he might make sounds or um, and he was hitting himself, so he was self-harming. And in public, you sort of think, mm, I don't, you know, I, I don't want him to be exposed to other people seeing that um, and judging him. So we felt that we would be judged as parents, if we work too much. Is it something about our genes? You know, will, will he not, will he be treated in a different way by his peers in school? In fact, actually in a group, a group of boys around about 30, they didn't really care as long as you could stand in goal foot and play football or soccer for the American uh, listeners here, you know, and, and play on a PlayStation. It didn't really matter. But but we worried as parents and I, we didn't tell anyone outside our immediate family for a very long time. And I was actually um, running a the London Marathon for the uh, Royal Charity Heads Together. Uh, this is a few years ago. And um, I don't know if you've ever met any of the royals, but you often don't know. You're at an event and you don't realise they're going to be there because of the security. They just turn up. And um, I, I was sort of in a group of people. And I realise now that was manufactured because that's what happens. The royal comes up to the group and talks to sort of three or four people. 
I just was pushed into a group and I was chatting with someone. And the person I was talking to, I could see was looking over my shoulder. And in media, you know that often happens. You're at a do and people are looking over your shoulder to see if there's someone better to talk to. And this lady who I knew was doing that, I thought, that's very rude. And then I turned around and Prince William was behind me, the future king of, uh, Brit of Great Britain. And um, he said, this was a, this marathon launch. So he shook my hand and said, hello, Sean, why are you running the London Marathon? And I just blurted out without thinking about it because I normally prepare things. And I said, um, my son's got OCD. And that's literally the first time I told anyone outside of immediate family. I'm telling the future king of England. And um, it, it felt like a weight lifted off my shoulders, David. It really did. It felt like sharing made things so much easier. But without being forced to do it, I probably wouldn't have told anyone. Um, it, why didn't you tell your family? What, what was the thing that kept you to, to hide it? I think partly embarrassment. I mean, I'm generally kind of private anyway. You know, it's, it's not just that that I don't tell my parents about. <laughs> you know, I don't, I, don't tend to, I don't tend to sort of tell most people most things. Um, so I think it's partly shame. It was partly I didn't want the fuss that I knew would kind of go with it, um, which sounds ridiculous now. Um, but you know what? One of the things that struck me about OCD, and, and I don't know how many people out there think the same, but this was, was very strong with me, was that, because there's a very, very long delay between people being diagnosed and people going to seek help. It's, it's about 10 years, it's, I mean, it's, it's phenomenal. People live with this for a long, long, long time before they actually get around to getting help. Because they're embarrassed, because they don't want to show people? I think partly is that, partly is that, but actually, in my case, and this sounds ridiculously naive now, I just thought it would go away by itself because it's so alien and it's so wrong and it's so um, just irrational that, and I'm not an irrational person. I just thought that one day, maybe tomorrow, hopefully tomorrow, I will wake up and it won't be there anymore because it feels like the kind of it feels like something which is being sort of done to you and it will it will stop um and so it was easier in a way to live with it and just wait for it to go away by itself but of course it doesn't go away by itself and so i think and there's also there's a series of hurdles which anyone who wants to get help has to cross there's the first of all you have to come to terms with what's happening and recognize it for what it is which is where the damaging stereotype of OCD goes wrong. Because if you're told constantly the OCD is around having a tidy sock drawer, then you think, well, I'm having these terrible thoughts about harming a child or catching HIV from a rusty nail. You know, what's wrong with me? So first of all, you have to realise what it is that you have is something which other people have and can therefore be helped. And then you have to get sort of come to terms with going to see someone about your mental health, which is, I think it's a lot better now. I think there is less of a stigma around mental health now, but but there was an awful lot. You know, I, and you probably will still remember the days when the local mental hospital was, was the loony bin, you know, and it was men with white coats are gonna come and get you if you behave in a weird way. This is before caring the community, you know, they actually would essentially lock people up. And, and so there was a real, um, Sort of damaging stereotype around people who went for help with mental health issues and and even if so you, you get to that point you, you realize what's wrong with you, you decide you need help then you get a situation which is what you and your family face was that even once you you put your hand up and, and try and get help you realize that it's not as easy as that you know you're at the end of a long queue of other people who need help and and then by the time you eventually get to see someone you then have to sort of go through it all again and explain what happened and then you get referred to someone and then the actual treatment itself is pretty difficult because essentially you're being asked to take on the the, 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 the topic of whatever it is that you're most sort of scared of. It's like that room 101 in George Orwell, you know, where they trap you in with the thing that you're most afraid of. It's like that, you have to encounter it, which most people just don't want to do. And so there's a series of hurdles which you have to, you have to leap over. Um, and at every one, it's easier just to turn around and say, I'll do it tomorrow. 
Um, and and uh, you mentioned that um, the average wait time for people from when they realise they have OCD from when they get treatment is 10 years. Um, and so effectively people are doing that, they're getting treatment when they're an adult. I, and I just, I feel so strongly about, I mean, all mental health issues that if we can sort things out when people are children. We've had a few messages actually from uh, something we were talking about earlier. Um, so um, this, let's see if I can put that up. Or did I? So Unstuck uh, an OCD Kids movie. So this is, there in the, the United States, serious lack of funding here too. If you want help immediately, you have to pay out of pocket. Um, I met so those guys. Denise. I don't know if you remember the yeah. people. I met you at a, um, an OCD event in the UK. Uh, yeah, I, I was probably at that event. We must have crossed paths um, earlier because uh, David and I haven't actually met in person and now with the lockdown, we, we're not going in for a while. But I think we've probably been to similar events because I've met those guys as well. Uh, this is Denise Lim. She's, I think she was in Australia, I think is what she said earlier. Yes, definitely. We have to book weeks and weeks in advance for mental health here. Uh, we have uh, Headspace, which is excellent. Uh, well, weeks sounds good compared to the UK, uh, to be honest, but still, that's long enough. When a ch child or anybody is brave enough to, to come, you know, to admit that they have an issue, a mental health issue, they need to, they need treatment, they need treatment there and then. They don't need to be waiting for, for a long time. Um, so this is Joanne Doll. I think she might have been in Australia as well. Need to pay to, to get help quickly here. Um, Kim French has said, uh, thanks for raising awareness, both of you. Um, I'm going to flip through some more. Um, the, I'll see if I can find some more. There's a, there, there are a lot more, actually. I'll, I'll work through some of those. Um, I just wanted to move the conversation onto the fact that something we touched on before, and that's the treatment. So I was alarmed when I first, my son was first treated, and it, it, the treatment worked, CBT, really good, the right CBT, um, and actually high levels of um, antidepressants. It seemed to work you know, hand in hand. I don't know how much the, um, let's just get that one, sorry. Uh, how much the uh, the antidepressants were working or whether it was the CBT, but collectively they seemed to work. But I was alarmed by the fact that it was such a high dose of uh, antidepressants. And that's why um, I joined up with Orchard, uh, which is a, an OCD charity, where, and you're part of this as well, um, crowdfunding to try and um, get enough money to trial psilocybin in the treatment of OCD. Now psilocybin is the active ingredient in magic, magic mushroom, which I know sort of alarms some people, um, and some people think it's quite amusing, but there is good evidence that psilocybin actually um, has effects on reducing the, the effects of OCD. So uh, in 2006, the University of Arizona did a study and um, they found good evidence that there is a link between the two. And we want to take this further, don't we, David? We want to, uh, it's just a, a, very, a, a very early trial um, and sort of experimental trial to see whether there is more, there is uh, there are grounds to do a bigger trial. Uh, so with crowdfunding, if, if you want to help with that, it'd be great. Um, it's You just need to go to orchardocd.org, that's O-R-G, orchardocd.org. I mean, we're really, we're really interested in, obviously, people donating, uh, people coming up with ideas that can help us, um, uh, people sharing our, our crowdfunding campaign. I think that's really important too. But other ideas, if you've got ideas of, of ways that we can raise money um, to, to get to the target that we, we want to get to. Uh, please do that. Uh, we ha had actually initially set a target of 50,000, that we put actually to 70,000 uh, pounds that we're trying to raise. I've actually heard today that we've reached 50,000 pounds, so we're doing really well. I, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna let you come in on this, David, in a minute, but I'm just, just looking at the figures before we came on air. Um, 1.5 million people in the UK, that's a population, if you don't live in the UK, of about 60 million. 1.5 million have OCD. It's, it's meant to be 3% of any population that have OCD. So in the States, that would be about 9.8 million. I, I've seen figures of 2.2 million, but that seems like a real underestimate. But if you think about the world, that's about 220 million people. I mean, if this is affecting so many people, and yet we have a very outdated, old way of treating. It feels crucial that we have things like Orchard trying to find new ways to solve this you know, OCD in people's lives. Would you say that, David? Absolutely, yeah. I, I think um, I, I think it's important to realise that this sort of the context in a way that mental health is just so far behind in terms of being able to find treatment. Um, you know, I, I describe it to people that if you go back to the 1950s, which isn't that long ago, really, in, in, in the great sort of scheme of medical progress, um, you know, if you think about the 1950s, the physicists had 
split the atom and then develop the atomic bomb. The the, the biologists had um, unraveled and deciphered the structure of DNA. And if I if I went to my doctor with OCD in the 1950s, the frontline treatment was on the bottom. You know, they they would actually stick needles into my brain and whittle them around until until they thought I was going to feel better. So you know, we're just we're just starting from a very low base with with OCD. Um, and, and of course, mental health. There are certain challenges to try and um, find new treatments. It's very, very complicated. It takes a long time. Um, you know, the market is, is arguably where it is most needed. Um, there, aren't, there aren't drugs available. Um, I think that. So one of one of the one of the ways around that problem is that you see what is already out there, what's already been identified, what's already been tested, what's already been looked at, and see, well, could this have a a, a secondary purpose? You know, and then that isn't that's not just with OCD, not just being on mental health. That's one of the things they're doing at the moment with the coronavirus. You know, what existing compounds, what existing treatments are there out there which we might be able to use for this as well? Because in fact, many of the the main drugs for OCD were discovered by accident because they were being used for something else. Um, you know, in, in many cases, depression, you know, which is why, which is why we have antidepressants associated with medicine, because they are very often given as depress antidepressants, and then they also seem to work with OCD, so they can co-opt with OCD. And and so the thing about psilocybin is that, you know, I do feel like I should be a responsible adult here and say, don't take magic mushrooms. This is, a, <laughs> this, is this is sort of pharmaceutical. I'm, I'm with you there, though, yeah. Pharmaceutical grade psilocybin you know, it's, it's, it's a world away from just taking a mushroom. Um, but you know, there is some evidence that it works, and, and there's some evidence that lots of other or some other compounds work as well uh, for various mental disorders. And um, I, I think for relatively small amounts of money, you can test and experiment to see if that is the case. And, and almost most importantly, if it isn't. Then we can put it to one side and focus on something else, uh, which is why it's really important that we, that, that I think that we do get this experimental uh, trial off the ground, um, just to just to tick the box, you know, and hopefully it will it will they'll, they'll find some benefits and it won't be a, it won't be whatever it is it won't be a cure for everybody it won't be a magic fix it will but hopefully it's something that we can add to the to the sort of weapons available which at the moment are. Are pretty slim and haven't been updated in, in a long time. Yeah, um, a couple of questions coming in. Margarita, uh, I wrote an email to Orchard this morning as I would love to volunteer in whatever way is possible. I hope you'll read it. Um, it's worth getting in touch with the guys at Orchard, um, uh, Margarita. So orchardocd.org. Org. I think there's a contact email there. I actually think the guys from Orchard are on of messaging here now, so they may respond to you. Um, there's a few other questions about, uh, so this is Denise again, um, how long was it between uh, when you experienced symptoms and got treatment? I think you mentioned 10 years as a sort of an average. Is that how it worked for you? No, so I was, um, I should say, or my publisher will kill me, this is all in my book, which is called <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome to plug it. Um, but only uh, once, and you can't say I've been on the journey once. You can only say <laughs> once as well. So you've, you've used up your your lives for those. Um, I, I was I first had these intrusive thoughts in 1991. Um, I, I got my elastic band in 1995. But if we're not really counting that, then I didn't get help until uh, it was when my daughter was born. So it was about 2009, 2010. So that is. 20 years, basically, isn't it? The best part of 20 years. Um, uh, Magali, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, Magali, probably. Um, I wanted to see what my life would be without OCD, but I'm also afraid. What is life without OCD? Who am I without OCD? OCD takes up so much of my life, it's scary to think about not having it. I, I think this is a really interesting point, because um, I, I see from the outside looking at my son, and I've seen OCD absolutely destroy his life, but now he's in a much better place. I can see that, I, I, where, where does the OCD end and where does his character start? Because his character is actually quite quirky and he thinks of things in a very different way to me. And I can see sort of uh, imprints of his, his, the way he thinks in an OCD way. 
And I, and I can't quite explain that in words, but he's a lot more creative than me. And he's, you know, he's, and I, you know, I'm very creative, but I can see he's just, he thinks in a very different way. And it's, it, it, and it's fascinating, really interesting. And actually, if I was to literally be able to grab the OCD and take it out of his life, would that change the person he is? Do you ever have thoughts like that? I, I mean, I do. I, I don't have a huge amount of sympathy for that view, partly from my own experience was that I can remember who I was before it happened. You know, I, I was sort of 18, 19 when this, when this came on. So I was a, an adult, basically, although a very young adult. And, and, and it was like, it was like something had happened to me that was external and didn't feel part of me at all. It didn't feel like it was integral to anything to do with my life. And I just wanted, wanted rid of it. I, I think what is true is that OCD doesn't, doesn't come out of nowhere. It doesn't just drop on people at random. Um, it does seem to be there is a certain personality type um you know maybe you are uh, you have a so psychologists would say maybe you've got an inflated sense of responsibility so maybe you think things are your fault or your responsibility to do things when they're really not or maybe you have this sort of what's called um sort of magical thinking maybe you kind of um so there's this it's called thought action fusion which means that to have thoughts are somehow significant which is actually in the bible you know one of the one of the ten commandments is, is thou shall not covet thy neighbor's ox. You know, just, to, just to think about wanting your neighbor's ox is as bad as to kill someone. And, and in fact, the, thing, the famous Sermon on the Mount, you know, just to, to think about adultery is as, is as bad as to do it. You know, just to think about having sex with someone you shouldn't is as bad as actually doing it, which is clearly nonsense because we can't control our thoughts. But that there is a sort of an argument which says that OCD is at the extreme end of that kind of personality in a way that depression is for the for certain personality perhaps or or um, anxiety is perhaps you know you have to be a certain amount sort of susceptible to these to these conditions and, and your personality type um, can make you more susceptible but I think that for me there was nothing in my life that OCD made it better or easier everything is better without it because i still feel like the same person i just don't have this horrific enduring anxiety about catching a horrible disease um you know i, I wouldn't want to be defined by that even if even if it even if it was me somehow you know i'd rather be somebody else and so to um i, can't, I haven't got my glasses on to, to magalize um, i would yeah. say that um Life without OCD is better, if, if it is OCD, because OCD by definition is something which makes your quality of life worse. It's that, that's what a medical disorder is. You know, it's, it's defined by the fact that it makes your life harder and, and reduces the enjoyment that you take out of things. So um, I, would, I guess there are many reasons to be nervous about seeking treatment for OCD, but but how you will feel if you get rid of it shouldn't be one of them, from my point of view. Yeah. So just going back to the Orchard trial, um, so it's the early stages. It's Imperial College here in London who are going to be doing it uh, under the sort of guidance of Professor David Nutt. Now, I, I understand Professor David Nutt will be doing something similar to us in the next couple of weeks. So if you have other questions, specific scientific questions, I think it's, it's worth coming back to this, this um uh, this space uh, in a few weeks' time and getting the, the real details and the nuts and bolts of this, sorry, no pun, uh, from Professor Nutt. Um, I think that he will be able to give you so much more details, but it, it, it is the early stages of a trial uh, and we hope that this will, it's basically dealing with psilocybin with 16 patients uh, and it's a single dosage and we hope that it will lay the foundation for something bigger. So please go to orchardocd.org um, if you want to donate or if you want to share that or if you have any ideas, please do uh, share them with us on how we can raise money, get to our 70,000 target. And I suppose, David, just before we, we go, if we are having this conversation in 10 years' time, and I, I guess it, it won't be on YouTube, the way technology changes, it will be something new. But we're having this conversation in 10 years' time. Do you think we'll be looking, uh, we'll be talking, uh, I'm asking you to look into your crystal ball here, talking about psilocybin as a, a really credible treatment for OCD? Oh, I mean, I hope so. <laughs> I put you on the spot there, sorry. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I guess we, we need to find out, don't we? Ask me in a year. You don't have to wait 10 years. Yeah. 
Uh, but oh, let's just broaden that out. Do you think? Do you think people will look back and say, "I can't believe they prescribed such high doses of antidepressants when actually all they needed to do was research this or research that, and there'll be much better treatments for mental health"? Because, as you said, it feels like mental health, mental illness, is the poor relation compared to physical illness. I, I mean, I'd love to think so, but I think realistically, I'm not sure there is a, a miracle drug around the corner. Um, I think it comes back down to what I was talking about originally was that although we need new weapons, uh, you know, we need new options like psilocybin or like any other um, particular individual compound that might come along. I think at the moment, if, if you were to say to me, what is the biggest improvement that we could make into mental health treatment? It would be improving access to the best treatments that we already have. Because there is a good treatment out there that works most of the time for most people. And it's just that a lot of people don't get a chance to try it. Um, and, and that, you know, it doesn't need whizzy new science or it just needs investment and sort of uh, commitment to, to make that available, to spread that through society, to give everyone who goes, to, who, who crosses those hurdles and, and realizes and asks for help to get the best help. Uh, and you, you went through, you, I mean, you went through the path earlier on. So people who have a mental illness firstly take a very long time to, to get help uh, and to actually seek it. Um, and when they seek it, as we experience, there's a often, and it sounds like in Australia, the USA, UK, I'm sure right around the world, there's a huge way in the same way that you wouldn't get the same way with physical illnesses. There's a massive way to get the right level of care. So actually, by the time you're treating this, I mean, there's just so many barriers. There's so much friction before you can get to the place um, that, that, that actually you need to be getting to as soon as you admit that you have a mental illness. I, don't just, I just thought of those figures with um, the UK. 1.5 million people in the UK have OCD or are affected by OCD. If, if every one of those gave a pound um, to orchard, I mean, or whatever treatment, I mean, you, there, there, is, there should be money. I mean, the government should be putting money forward. Um, mental illness needs to be getting parity with physical illness right across the board. And the other thing is the stigma. We didn't tell people until I was basically forced to tell that the future king of England. People don't want to talk about it in mental illness or OCD or, or anything like that. And I feel all those things need to change. Uh, access, the stigma, um, and then the amount of care, the, the things like Orchard are doing, the, 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 the options that you have because 40% of people, um, CBT and medication on Antidepressants doesn't work for them. All those things need to change, and it, it, I'm, I just hope that in ten years' time, when we have this interview, we'll look back and say, "Do you remember that chat we had, and what the situation was like?" It's so much better now, but um, uh, sadly, I, you know, that may not happen, and we may still be struggling away and having the same rant about the, the lack of services for, for mental illness. Um, so, David, you're well in yourself, anyway. And are you writing a new book? Uh, my my agent keeps saying that as well. <laughs> I, I sorry might, i might end up writing something about what's going on at the moment but um everyone's all over it so i don't know what else what new there is what th new things there are to say um but yeah in terms of you know almost going back to what the question was about life after ocd i think that i mean i hesitate to say that i'm sort of over it uh, or, that I'm or anything like that but but you know when people ask me you know how you do and i say well you know what i have good days and i have bad days and that's a lot better than only having bad days. Yeah, yeah. and uh, I think if you can focus on the positive, you, know, you can build out of it. Um, look, David, it's been such a pleasure talking to you, and, and when this lockdown is over, it'll be really good to actually, actually probably catch up at one of these OCD conferences that we seem to both go to, but never actually yeah. meet. So it'll be really good to chat to you, but it's been, it's been wonderful. And thank you, everyone, for, uh, for your comments, your questions. You've really helped shape this, this chat. Um, I was going to call it a debate, but I think we're both on the same side here, aren't we? We're, we're both, uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> flying the flag for mental illness and in particular OCD. And just let me uh, give you one mention, one more mention of that um, uh, OCD charity. It's orchardocd.org, uh, orchardocd.org if you want to get involved or help with the name. We've reached 50,000 pounds, that is, and we're trying to get to 70,000 pounds. And then this trial uh, can go ahead. So it's really exciting. and. Um, I'm, you know, I'm buzzing about it, and I'm so chuffed that we're we're getting close to that target. Thank you all very much indeed, and David, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks all. Bye. Goodbye.